Welcome to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, episode number 31. It is not what you have or who you are or where you are or what you're doing that makes you happy or unhappy. It is what you think about. Dale Carnegie. This is the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, where we teach you the top strategies, tactics, and growth hacks that every indie filmmaker needs to know to make money with their films. We are the podcast that puts the business back into show business. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Film Entrepreneur Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. Now, today on the show, we welcome Brad Olson, the film entrepreneur behind the hit documentary, Off the Tracks which is a movie about Final Cut Pro X, the editing software. And today we talk about his misadventures in distribution and how he was able to self-distribute this film and how he was able to focus his very niche movie and reach his niche audience and how he's been able to do it. We talk numbers, we talk marketing strategies, how we got the movie out there and so much more. So this is a really interesting conversation And he learned a lot of lessons along the way, including talking to 40 distributors and why he decided not to go with a traditional distributor. And like I've said before, traditional distribution has its place without question. Self-distribution is not for everybody. It's not for every film. But it made sense for this film because of its nature. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Brad Olson. I'd like to welcome back to the show Brad Olson, man. Thank you for coming back, brother. Yeah, it's great to be here. First question is, what kind of distribution plan did you even think about when you started off the tracks? Or did you even think about distribution? (laughs) That's a great question. (laughs) So initially, when I had the idea, I actually, you know, in my head, I was envisioning everything from a simple just throw throw something, throw some episodes up on Vimeo for free. Um, to what if I, you know, got this up on iTunes and everything else. So I wasn't really sure I wanted, I I really wanted to figure out what the quality of the content and the demand of the, of what this content would be before I necessarily locked myself into a plan. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, actually I was having a conversation, uh, last week with somebody in New York who, who was talking about how he's looking at everything I've done to promote my movie. And he's like, wow, you just had it all figured out. And I'm like, actually, I've kind of been <laughs> feeling my way step by step. <laughs> you right. know, this, isn't, this wasn't something that was like a, a total master plan from the front, although I did imagine a lot of things. And I kind of, I kind of thought, okay, if I want to get here, like let's reverse engineer what I need to do today. So the ultimate pie in the sky dream was let's get it on iTunes. Let's get it maybe on Netflix, which hasn't happened yet. Um, but let's, let's see where we can get it. And if I'm going to do that, what do I have to do today to get it there? And you know, if it doesn't, if it 
turns out there isn't the demand or I don't get the quality I want from it, that I think there's some at least some interesting little, I can throw up the interviews or epi- little episodes onto Vimeo was kind of my fallback plan. Okay. So that was what was in my head at the time when I very, very first started. So you're just kind of thinking, of, you, you, you actually were, you had no idea, honestly. <laughs> no, I, didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know what it would do. I just knew that I had to start and I tried to point my ship in the direction that would hopefully land. It's like Columbus trying to discover the new world, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so after you obviously have uh, associated yourself with Columbus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so at what point did you say, okay, this is going to be a feature film and I'm going to try to sell it and try to, you know, get it out there in the world as a documentary feature? So I had already shot interviews um, at the Final Cut Pro 10 Creative Summit, Mm -hmm. which is an annual event that's held in Cupertino, uh, Apple headquarters. And um, I'd shot like 20 interviews there. I went to L.A. and shot some more interviews. At that point, I was like still kind of leaning towards the I'll make like six 15 minute episodes and they'll go up on Vimeo route. Mm -hmm. Um, And then. One day, as I was posting about it on a Facebook group, uh, a guy named Noah Kadner, who runs an organization called FCP Works, reached out and said, hey, have you interviewed anybody from Apple for your documentary? And I'm like, I'd met a couple people at the Creative Summit, um, but I said, no, I haven't. Like, (laughs) They can't go on record. He's like, well, what about Randy? And he was referring to Randy Ubilos. And Randy Ubilos... um, is the guy I think I mentioned on the last episode that invented Premiere and Final Cut in the 90s and mm-hmm. then went on to do like Aperture and iMovie and Final Cut Pro 10. Um, and Randy had retired in 2015. So actually, he's somebody that could uh, be in the documentary because he wouldn't have to get permission from Apple to be in it. Uh, but he's also a guy that travels the world constantly and I don't know him and I didn't really know anybody who could put me in contact with him however here's the funny thing part of that story is in this facebook group randy's actually a member of it It it's like this secret final cut group and he's a member of that group he's never posted to my knowledge anything in this group at all uh but i had the option to tag him and i thought well (laughs) let's just let's just see (laughs) <laughs> what happened? So I said, I don't know. I don't know how to get a hold of Randy. And then I had, and then I tagged him. I'm like, but I'm would be, would love to interview him. Well, he messages back. Not that like minutes later, he messages back and and gives me his email. Okay. And I was just blown away. And that's when I went to interview him, and I realized that okay, this is no longer just the Final Cut community story about Final Cut Pro 10. We've got the man in the film. This probably has some value. Let's run a Kickstarter and see where that mm. takes us. Okay. So you, you when I, and I'll, I'll translate this for the audience. So basically you were doing market research when you didn't even know you were doing market research, mm-hmm. uh, but pretty much to the point where like, well, now you're very cautious and conservative on the way that you went through this process. No, because most filmmakers are just like, screw it. Let's do it. Let's cash out. Let's get a mortgage on the house. Let's do this. Um, <laughs> and just roll the dice. But you were very methodical and, and conservative in the way that you were kind of rolling this out. And you're like, okay, well, I think we have something. Let's try to do a Kickstarter to see you wanted to test the waters of yes. your of your niche audience. And this is obviously a very niche film. It's a niche mm-hmm. of a niche of a niche. Um, and it's not a large audience, but yet it is a large, it's not a large audience compared to the, like the rest of the world, but it's still, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a small audience, but they're spread out globally, mm-hmm. which is interesting. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit too. Yeah. So, all right. So now you do your Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. So, uh, Noah Kadner, who had, was the one who suggested I interviewed people at Apple. He, he also lives in San Francisco. So does Randy. So he went with me to the interview and he was actually the one who pitched the Kickstarter and said, I- I'm willing to help you out with this. So, cause he, and he'd actually, I'd shown Randy the first opening 15 minutes of the film as I had it at that point, which is kind of a hard part of the film, I think, for him to watch because it is just all about 
the lousy roll out, roll out of the product. But mm-hmm. Randy was gracious and he was, you know, didn't say, didn't rip up the release form there. And Noah saw that and he's like, I think you've, you've got some quality here. I think you got something of value. So let's, let's run a Kickstarter and see what, where it goes. Uh, again, you talk about being conservative. I was actually even conservative with the Kickstarter. I, I, <laughs> um, I decided to reach out to, uh, to people who were like software trainers and, um, plugin developers and podcasters and, and things that were in the Final Cut community that kind of, that made their living based off of people buying Final Cut Pro 10 related stuff. Mm-hmm. And Smart. I committed, I committed them, you know, to like put in a thousand dollars each. Um, some of them put in some more, uh, like motion VFX, uh, was a huge supporter of it. Um, so you were getting sponsors for this already. I was getting sponsors Jeez. before saying, Hey, we're thinking about doing a Kickstarter. If we did a Kickstarter, would you be willing to put in a thousand or $2,000? And, and based off of that, we're like, okay, we've definitely got nine or 10 people willing to throw in money. Let's ask for ten thousand dollars. We know we can make it. <laughs> like, <laughs> not You're like anything. we literally have ten thousand sitting waiting. Well, let's just open up a Kickstarter for ten thousand. Kickstarter for ten thousand. And and I also <laughs> was thinking, you know, I've shot almost everything. I'm editing this myself. Sure. Um, you know, maybe some money to get a score, pay a lawyer or something. I don't know. Like, let's just. <laughs> let's, you were doing it more for market little, research than you were for money. Yeah, and and it's like this was more about raising awareness that there is a Final Cut Pro 10 documentary. The other thing that we did previously to launching the Kickstarter, um, and this was, again, kind of Noah's marketing brain at work and him kind of guiding me, was uh, uh, let's do a trailer. Mm-hmm. So so I put out a trailer and I, like on Facebook got like 30,000 views and got 200-something shares. And then got like twenty thousand views on um, YouTube, and then uh, and then we got all these like Final Cut and Mac blog sites writing about it and saying there's going to be this documentary, there's going to be this documentary. So that kind of all was the preamble to okay, now let's do the Kickstarter. So when we did the Kickstarter, um, the first day, now I mentioned that I had some people like lined up, mm-hmm. and of course there was no like written contracts or anything sure, to sure. back out, but just got that feel. And, uh, and we made the $10,000 in a day and actually most of that money did not come from my sponsors, which that surprised me. Really? <laughs> so I was like, wow. So the trailer was effective. And once the Kickstarter like, Hey, we have a Kickstarter now, you know, I'd, I'd already kind of warmed up everyone up and primed them. And then a weekend and some more sponsors kind of came on board, but, uh, we actually doubled that and got to $20,000 by a weekend. And then by the end of it, we were at $26,000. And that was um, really overwhelming for me because it kind of showed that, hey, this little thing that you've been doing, you know, basically started out with, uh, you know, maxing out a business credit card. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's of all course. the money, you know, a couple grand or whatever well, sure. in the bank. Um, now, uh, now there's, there's obviously some people that are will- that want to see this. But the other thing that comes along with that is the the terror of, oh my hell, I have to actually make this movie. <laughs> like I have to really do this because now I've got like 200 people that are sitting there saying, "Hey, when's the movie coming out? Hey, when are we going to get?" And how so? How posters? much did you how much did you finally raise? Twenty six thousand dollars. You know what, man? Twenty six thousand dollars for a movie about Final Cut Pro X is not bad at all. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Uh, and it, and it kind of, and I thought if there's if there's this many people that, that are willing to put in this much money now, then we you know we we can this is something that we can get out there on platforms and sell. Mm-hmm. Um, not expecting to make you know tons of money off of it, but I think the last episode I talked to you, when you said why I make a movie about this, and I'm like, well, I, you know, Final Cut's a, a kind of a, has a message that I'm passionate about and want to get out there, and I want to get my own name out there, so. Um, there was lots of motivations for me to to want to do this, not just uh, make a bunch of money. But you know, I, I, the fun thing about self distribution and doing this process is also just seeing can it be done? Can you make a low budget m- movie? And you know, proving to myself is it possible to to make make this kind of a a thing that that I could repeat and do again and maybe do a little bit bigger next time? Well, I mean, 
you, your story so far is a perfect candidate for for uh, self distribution. Like if you would have reached out to me as a consultant, <clears throat> I would have said absolutely yes because it makes the most sense in the world. And you were in a very similar place that I was with my first feature, This Is Meg, where I was walking in in the black. Like I, I, I the movie, I would, I was already shooting the movie when I started my crowdfunding campaign. Mm-hmm. And by the time, you know, we didn't, we didn't even make that much money. Um, we made, I think, fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars. And I was like, well, great. Now we can, you know, get real big sound design done and all this other stuff. But I was in the black. So the moment I released it, I was already in the positive. So you have yep. nothing to lose. Um, and that's, that's the best place to be, obviously, if you can be, um, right. no with any product on houses, didn't sell my car, n- nothing <laughs> crazy, you know, oh, correct. And so it was, a, it's a perfect candidate for the film and because it's such a niche audience and it's, it's a niche audience, but you tapped into the larger niche, which is Mac, Mac, uh, the Mac world uh, yeah. and the Mac followers and those, cause those guys are, are crazy. And that's a large <laughs> I'm one of them. I drank the Kool Aid a long time ago, um, <laughs> but uh, but that or that part that kind of fan base for Mac is a huge uh, sub genre subculture. Uh, and out of those, there was a you know a smaller culture that even cared about Final Cut Pro, but that is still a, a good a good market to tap into. Now, so now you have the movie. You're gonna go out to distribute it. How did you choose the platforms that you did? Well, actually, I'm going to back up a little bit because you Go mentioned ahead. like the the plan from there kind of evolved to should we try to see mm-hmm. like I was still testing the waters. Still, I wanted you to still don't believe it. I mean, you still don't believe it. Yeah, I mean. well, and I wanted I wanted to self distribute, <laughs> but I also wanted to I wanted to see if there was some magical partnership or or distributor out there that got this movie and thought that they could you know sell it. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't. I didn't want to take any deals that were um, definitely no deals that were going to be like you have to pay money up front or stupid things like that. Mm-hmm. But I was curious because I'd never been down this road of distribution if there was somebody. So we actually started reaching out to a lot of distribu- distribution companies. Oh God, and yes, I, that should be amazing. Tell me, tell me what they, <laughs> tell me, tell me what they said. Oh they please, Brad. And oh gave please, me Brad. Of please, Brad. No. Tell me what they said when you called up and say, "Hey, I have a documentary about Final Cut Pro X, and I want to hear the crickets on the other line." I want to hear what they said, sir. Well, here's the funny <laughs> thing. Um, most people never replied. Not surprising. <laughs> right. The ones that did yes. said, hey, you've got a great documentary. Uh-huh. It does not fit our catalog. Okay. It does. We don't know how to sell this. Okay. Um, I got really, in fact, actually, well, well, so that, that I, I kind of was going through that for a few months. Okay. Just trying to figure out. If there was, but yeah, they, they definitely didn't get it. And I, that did not surprise me. But no. Again, feeling my way, I just wanted to see, I was curious, would somebody offer me $10,000, $15,000 or $30,000 mm-hmm. for the movie? Would they have want to, you know, and, and, and I felt like it, mostly I just wanted help with the, the legal clearance stuff and the, uh, and the whole, um, getting it out on different platforms. Mm-hmm. Um, not looking for like definitely no, no, I, no ambition to do any sort of theatrical distribution. Um, <laughs> right. Broadcasting didn't make any sense to me, but you know, I wanted to get it on there. I'd never done it. And I, and, and I didn't approach it. It's not like all the distributors I approached were like big time distributors, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, they're definitely. And I mean, it's funny because I actually, one of the distributors, I never heard back from these guys, but they distributed a movie about Compaq in the 80s. And I sure. thought, you know, that's like super niche and no one cares about it. So, and I watched it and it was similar to, to my documentary. I actually saw that. I saw that documentary. I actually, I'm one of those yeah, guys. I like it, but I'm <laughs> like just saying it it's kind of, it's, you know, and then what's funny about the documentaries, they have to constantly like, Compared to Apple, which I'm like, if they made this documentary in the 90s, they wouldn't even breathe a word about. Or they maybe a little bit about Apple, but right is mostly because the time it was made. So anyway, I I tried to reach out to a lot of those people, but um, the crazy thing that happened actually this year uh, around NAB 
is right before I I, will, I decided, okay, I've, I promised my Kickstarter backers an advanced download of the movie. So I had put it up on VHX, mm-hmm. um, and I'd been running pre-sales on VHX and as a way to kind of keep the Kickstarter thing going, you know, like generating a little bit more money. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then I, well, I was going to release it to just them and according to VHX documentation, there was a way to kind of release your movie to people before making it available for sale. But then when I actually went to click those buttons, it didn't work. And I had to make the movie available for sale <laughs> in order to <laughs> send it to my Kickstarter backers. Sure. And so I'm like, I'm going to be real quiet about this. I'm just going to post a, a thing on Kickstarter, just a private message. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or update and uh, and I'll just send it to them. Mm-hmm. Well, they started sharing it with like everybody. immediately. Hey, yeah. it's up! It's for sale. Like I did no publicity and that like and and it was for sale for uh, like a day or so and we were like raking in hundreds of dollars. You know, nothing glamorous, but mm-hmm. still like I think we ended up it was like on sale for one week and we made like $3,000 in that, or maybe it was like $2,500 in that week. Okay. And, uh, and without me like announcing it officially on Facebook or sending out a newsletter or sure, anything, sure. just to my 200 Kickstarter backers that were like excited about it. Mm-hmm. And during that time, that's when after like a couple months, uh, one distrib- distributor in particular, all of a sudden was like, Hey, wait, wait, wait. Um, I really want to help you guys sell, like distribute this movie and I have this plan and whatever. But in order for us to talk, you got to stop sales. No. And I was like, absolutely. You you literally have to stop sales. I was like, this is just a talk. Well, because he had a relationship with a bigger company and he, and he was so excited. He was a sales rep. He's actually a theatrical distributor. Uh huh. That works with other distributors to get things out on other platforms and whatnot. So he, we told him that, well, we're not interested in the theatrical. Mm-hmm. So he's like, that's cool. I've got a relationship with this company. Actually, a pretty big company that I was like, he's like, I'm really good friends with this guy there. And I'm like, okay. Um, I spun it a little bit because um, <laughs> mm-hmm. I realized that the thing that worried me the most is if I stop sales or the people who already bought it, are they going to – not be able to have access anymore. Well, it turns oh, out on VHX you can you can stop sales, and they still have access. Mm-hmm. So that was a relief. Um, I was actually I have actually a couple producing partners on this. I'm being very candid with you, by the way. Uh-huh. <laughs> but no one else is listening. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but uh, they, we were actually kind of in panic mode at the time because it was like, how do we say this without being like without this looking like a big disaster? Like, we don't know what the heck we're doing, and which we kind of <laughs> didn't. And uh, and it actually worked really well. We, we did a little blog post. We, we, we spun it as, hey, good news. We're, uh, we have a distribution deal in the works. And, but in order to do that, we have to stop sales on this platform. But don't worry. You still have access to this. You, we made everybody who bought it mm. and the, the, the Kickstarter people um, feel very special. And actually, even in the, again, actually going back to this conversation I had with a guy in New York, um, he was like, I was one of the guys who got it in March. Like he felt really <laughs> special. That, like, no, those are called the um, super fans. Those are super, super fans. fans. Yeah, they're, they're, there's there's fans and then there's like early adopters and those kind of people. Those are the ones you want because they're the ones who are going to spread the word. And that's exactly yeah, what so, happened. So we kind of we kind of we pulled it, um, you know, and then and then we waited. And I was at NAB when we finally heard back that they you know said what everybody else said. They're like, well. No, we're gonna pass. Like, good so film, ridiculous. good job. So ridiculous. And I'm like, well, thanks a lot for you know giving me like heart palpitations and stuff. So now you have to so, go put it back on on Vimeo or on. So VHX. well, at that point, we were talking to Mike Horton with the Los Angeles Creative Pro User Group mm-hmm. about doing a Los Angeles um, premiere. Mm-hmm. So, and that was going to be like originally, I wanted that a little sooner, but he had people lined up he had like mm. black magic coming and other people lined up for his meetings so we were gonna we were having that set up in june and i also decided this would be a good time to maybe take care of some clearance stuff that i maybe hadn't done up to that point 
Um, <laughs> one of those things being, uh, and, and like I talked to a lawyer and, and everything has, everything had passed the, uh, initial kind of sniff um, test. fair use test. Yeah. <laughs> the sniff test. Mm -hmm. But, uh, there was one clip in particular. He was like, Oh, you know, why don't I was using the a clip from the Conan show. Yeah. yeah. And, and it arguably it could be fair use, but I didn't have somebody in the documentary saying, you know, Conan even made fun of it or something. If I had somebody who had actually said, like had set up the clip uh -huh. and then shown it, mm -hmm. that can count from my understanding. Again, not a lawyer, but um, my understanding was that could count as fair use. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have that. I just had the Conan clip. So he said, why don't you just reach out to the the people at Conan? And I'm sure they, you know, they, they won't really care or whatever. I don't know why he said that, mm -hmm. but um, kind of bad advice. Uh, <laughs> Never and, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, but, but through, I, I found like some, I found the Conan press releases uh -huh. and I found a PR guy for Conan. And so I emailed them and I told them a little about what I was doing and he forwarded it directly to Jordan Shalansky, who's the associate producer on the show. And if you ever watch Conan, yeah. um, you know who he is. Yeah. Uh, he's definitely a, a, comes off as a weirdo in a lot of sketches. Yeah. And I was like, holy crap, this is Jordan Shalansky. And he's, and he's like, fill out this form. So I fill it out. And he was pretty cool, but he was like, like he, when he got back to me and this was kind of holding me up a little bit, um, uh, just like getting it out on sale and everything. And then he finally got back to me and he said, well, it looks like you want, you know, um, in perpetuity, which is uh, unfortunately our most expensive license. But I think he's, he's thinking broadcast world. I'm like, dude, this is a documentary that's going to be out there. I can't like cut the segment out later i mean mm -hmm. i guess it kind of could have but um so i don't know any other way to do it he was he said hey if you just want to do it for festivals and whatever we can license the clip for 500 dollars, and then with the understanding that once you get you know your full distribution in place um that uh you know you'll pay the full amount which he quoted me as twelve thousand dollars for like 14 or 15 seconds of conan jesus and christ well, okay, and here's here's the funny thing. I talked to a buddy of mine who works in documentaries, and he's made documentaries for like um, Discovery and mm -hmm. and A and E and things like and, and things like that. And he said, and Smithsonian, and he's like, okay, Brad, Walter Cronkite costs half that much. <laughs> Fair <laughs> Walter enough. Walter freaking Cronkite. Got it. He's like, it is not worth. And not only did I not have the money, but it just was not worth paying that much for the Conan clip. Lose mm -hmm. the lose the fifteen seconds of the film. I would agree with you. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I would I would agree with him too. I just that doesn't like, make a whole lot like, of financial if, sense. And he's like, even if you had a hundred thousand dollars set aside for just licensing, this clip wouldn't be worth it. Now, of course, I could go the route of trying to do the clearance thing, but it just it seemed easier to just lose fifteen seconds of got the it, film. Got it. Got it. Got it. So, so that, going, once so you, I had that done, right. then I was like, okay, let's get this thing for sale now. We've this was the last thing in question. Mm -hmm. We've uh, you know, we've got everything else cleared, so let's just let's just get let's, the show on the road. So there was about it. a month, June I did the LA showing. Um and actually we invited Rob Ash uh to that showing, but he couldn't make it. He had to go home and watch some kids or something. Mm -hmm. I, I really wish he could have made it because we actually at that point had still had the Conan clip in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I and then I just once I heard back, which was after that screen or I think it was right before. That's when I started kind of prepping this July um, 24th release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 24th. Uh, and that was uh, VHX and back on VHX. And then I wanted to like show that I'd been doing something. Mm -hmm. In this time period. So I also had gotten some, I think I'd been working on some captions in the meantime, like sure, sure, foreign language you. stuff gotcha. and, and Amazon, which, uh, if you, my understanding is if you go through an aggregator, you can release some more territories on Amazon, yes. but if you don't, you can still release through the U S and U S and UK. UK. Right now. That's it right now. And actually Germany is it on there. It was, it wasn't sure uh, if it's there anymore. You might have gotten in at Germany, but they don't allow it anymore. I don't think. I was just talking to those guys. I think Germany uh, and, and Japan 
were the other two. Yeah, Japan was kind of weird because you had to burn in the subtitles from what I was reading. Mm. Anyway, this is all this is nerdy stuff. But the the fact is I could get it without paying for an aggregator at sure. this point. I could get it on Amazon. I had also at the same time been waiting to hear back from an aggregator. I'd submitted stuff to an aggregator for iTunes, mm-hmm. but they hadn't assigned me a sales rep. And so I finally, in July, like after a month of waiting to hear back, I wrote in their support and I said, hey, what's the deal? Where's my sales rep? I want to get this show on the road. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't have the iTunes stuff set up, uh, set up in time. But by that point, people were like emailing me daily and messaging, where's the movie? When can I see the movie? So got it. I didn't, I didn't want to lose that momentum and that excitement. And then you release, so you have a theatrical, you had a screening in LA, you've put it back out on VHX and then the money starts coming back in. Are you starting to get attention again? Yeah. So that, like the, that week, the last week of July, um, on VHX, I think we made, we made about Mm $3,000, most of it being the kind of the launch day. Um, and of course I, I timed that with some articles and things as well coming out on different blogging sites, uh, Premium B, Pond5, FCP.co, or just a, a no film school were all sites that were writing about it um, to drive sales. And I was trying to get coupon codes out there. Mm-hmm. It was kind of crazy because uh, I put a bunch of coupon codes out and hardly anybody like really shared them. And then even when they were shared, most people weren't using them. But I was like, okay, more money for me. I guess. <laughs> you know, but it was part of my whole like, this will be good for you know, marketing and whatnot. Um, specifically the bonus feature edition, uh, which was like, I, which was basically the package I delivered to my Kickstarter backers Mm -hmm. at a stretch goal, like we'll do extended interviews and stuff. And, Mm -hmm. and so, uh, that was because the Kickstarter thing was $25. I left that at $25, $25, but then I had a $5 off coupon. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, for it. So anyway, and you're doing, by the way, you're, you're doing all of this by yourself at this point. Pretty much. Like I said, I have a couple people that were helping me with like Facebook ads and helping me with some logistical stuff. But, uh, you know, when you're seeing most of the posts are written by me and most of the, you know, trying to like, in fact, actually the other boring thing I've spent way too much time and I still have to spend more time is like formatting captions and language captions. Ooh, fantastic. Which now you could just go to rev.com and do. Um, much well, easier. Well, I have the trans and I have the translations and stuff, but yeah, Rev Rev is so much easier. It, yeah, <laughs> it's just, dude, dude. It's I mean, for other languages, I think it's three bucks a minute. Just, mm-hmm. are you kidding me? That's not, had, that was twenty dollars a minute before. Well, uh, yeah, I, I actually had somebody um, in course. Japan. Of course, you did. Why reach out you? to me, <laughs> and and he's like, hey, uh, and he got the movie back in March. And he's like, I love your movie so much. I've been spent, I've been translating it to Japanese. Here's the here's the SRT. There are <laughs> there are there are wonderful human beings on the planet who do things like that. And, yeah, and fans, and then, man, it's true. It's true. I, I get stuff like that. The people do stuff like that sometimes for for stuff that I do. I was like, wow, God bless, man. That's awesome. <laughs> now you were talking a little bit about social media. So how did you? Where, how did you find where the where your niche audience was? How did you kind of attack and your marketing plan? So now you already got the movie out. You already are selling it. And now how did you kind of come up with this marketing plan, this social media marketing plan, and what platforms did you use and so on? Well, I'm kind of lame in that I'm not – and I need to get on uh, other platforms, but I'm not like on Instagram or Twitter. Mm-hmm. I have fans that are on there that share stuff on there for me, but mm-hmm. – Um, I don't have an official thing there. Most of what I'm doing is on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Uh, the nice thing though is because in the years leading up to making this film, I was already part of the edit communities and the final cut communities and the Mm -hmm. Apple communities on Facebook. And I'm an active member of those. Mm -hmm. I already had. You've um, built, you already built in that. Tr- Cause a lot of times people, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of times I always tell people when they're going to try to go after an audience, you go into where those audiences live and you yep. become part of that audience by yep. posting and providing value. You've already done that. So you already knew yep. where this audience was living. Yep. And they were already kind of aware of me and I, and, uh, and what I was doing and they've been following the, the making of process, you know, and I've been updating people on that. And that, and that, I think that's a good thing too. It's, 
yeah, I, sometimes I feel a little guilty of that I'm um, sort of just sell it, trying to sell stuff on there. But at the same time, this is information that they're all interested well, in. You're providing value. About. You're providing value. Exactly. And, um, you know, I'm also always chiming in and helping people out sure. uh, with their editing questions and stuff as well. So it was – you know, it, it was like you said, it's a, it was providing some value and, and people are, are definitely always really excited when uh, something when I mention some news or whatever. Of, hey, I'm on this podcast or hey, and then and, we've and, got this thing. And you were saying that you worked on Facebook ads. Did you did you spend a lot of money or did you spend some money on Facebook ads trying to get the word out? So, um, you know, most of the the. the early stuff has been very viral and shared very well, which, which is awesome. I didn't have to spend any money. Uh, once we had it on sale, we started, we've been, we've been testing the waters with the Facebook ad stuff. I think in the next month or so, we're going to double down and have more targeted ads. I've got clips lined up like short video clips from the documentary Mm -hmm. that I'm going to start rolling out because video always does better. And, and I'm paying obviously for, for some ad stuff. Um, so, and there's there's a whole back end of building an audience on Facebook. Some of it is a little bit creepy, to be frank. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's how Facebook makes its money, and that's how mm-hmm. we target people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is kind of creepy. I'll tell you, it's, it's insane how detailed they can get. Well, you okay, here's an example of something, um, again, being very candid. But you can take – and I'm I, I'm not selling anybody's personal information. Of course not. make that clear. Yes. But you can take an email list – and because those people are on Facebook, no. you can you can build what they call a lookalike audience. It's really easy to do. So um, I'm not like targeting the people that bought the movie, but it's basically saying, what are their likes and interests for the people that already like your Facebook page? Mm-hmm. And how do we target people that are like that, that have similar interests? Like, And so that's the funny thing when people think it's cute and fun to like share their likes and interests and mm-hmm on Facebook or join certain groups or whatever, I'm like, you know, that's fun for you, but this is all data mining for these companies, which is a whole another rat hole. Mm-hmm. Um, benefits, it can it can be work to your advantage if you're an independent filmmaker and you're trying to find more people that might be interested in what you're doing because you can pay Facebook to target people in certain regions. Like in my case, like, okay, New York, LA, San Francisco, there's probably clusters of people Expensive um, to market to those people too, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So you. I mean, but but it, like you said, the the nice thing about having a niche of just editors is, um, I think it's a lot. You can narrow down a lot of those interests and things. Very much so. Now, how big of a part was the international audience uh, for your film? So, yeah. When you look at when I look at my um, hits on. The website, um, which is like actually the last week uh, has been about 200 views a day. And um, and then when you look at purchases of the movie, it's somewhere between 60 to 70 percent are not domestic uh, hits and That's sales. Awesome. That's amazing. It's, it, and it is like the craziest countries from all over the, the planet mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. I'm wow. And, you know, I saw a little bit of that when I ran the Kickstarter and I was having to like mail packages to. Israel and Spain and um, Australia and other places, mm-hmm. um, but but since the movie's been on sale, it's just been crazy. Uh, you know, Europe is obviously a big one, but even Asian countries and other places that I would not have expected hits in the Middle East and in Africa that I'm like, I don't even know how they know about this, other than these are people who are on Facebook. Have, <laughs> they're on Facebook. They have Final Cut. And, and, you know, the same thing can be said, the, the number one, um, final cut group was actually started by a friend and neighbor of mine, <laughs> Braden stores. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's got about 30,000, the final cut pro 10 editors group has over 30,000 people on it. And mm-hmm. you can look at that and see it's a very international group of people who are using it. And, and of course it is because, um, you know, the, the number reported earlier this year, for total installs of Final Cut Pro 10 was 2.5 million. Um, that was, I shouldn't say installs. That's actually, they, they say the term seats, which was explained to me as mm-hmm. actual purchases of the app. Mm-hmm. So just probably installed in many more places. <laughs> yes. Like you can buy a copy of Final Cut Pro 10 and the license agreement says 
you can put it on any, as many Macs as you own. Or if you're at a business or school, then you have to have a license per machine because it's a multi-user machine, you know. Mm-hmm. But that being said, there's no actual physical mechanism to stop you from signing in on your Apple ID and putting it on 100 computers. Sure. So who knows how many people actually use Final Cut or in what ways they use Final Cut. I'm very interested to know that because we know they're not using Final Cut Pro 10 very much in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Um, per se, but there's this whole global audience of people that are using it for all sorts of things, which I think speaks to the democratization of our craft. No, without, <laughs> without, without question. So yeah, it's, it's interesting how, uh, cause I have listeners from in part in the countries that I'm, I'm like, how are you, how did you hear about me? How did you, <laughs> what? Like, right. you know, but they don't even speak English there. How are you listening to me? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> Um, but I'm very grateful and have a, and it is interesting that this is a, w- a global thing and you have to look at it as a global thing because uh, filmmakers, a lot of times they just concentrate on the U S they just concentrate on, 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 on America as the biggest market. And it is the biggest, but it's not as big as the rest of the world in many ways, specifically mm-hmm. depending on your movie. And, uh, and I think you, you, unwittingly <laughs> started mm-hmm. seeing uh, that by doing your movie and by using a platform like VHX, which is owned by Vimeo, anybody internationally could buy there. Like iTunes, yes. you have to go to territories and Amazon, oh you have to go gosh. to territories. But with – Well, and and I was told by the aggregator, you know, it's like um, to change the – to open up the metadata or whatever is like a $200 base fee. And for each additional language, which I have to do a new poster for mm-hmm. – and um, a description for uh, translated, in addition to the subtitles, uh, is another 150 bucks. So if you're trying to get five or six languages, like that adds up really fast. And that's actually the next thing I'm going to be doing on iTunes. But um, it's like this costs are a you lot. On, whereas, are, so you are on iTunes now? I am on iTunes, yeah. So as uh, about a month ago, a little less than a month ago, we finally – once the once I got a sales rep assigned uh, from this aggregator, mm-hmm. then – the ball really started rolling fast on uh, getting everything prepped for iTunes. There was a lot of learning that I had to do. And honestly, um, I should have followed your advice <laughs> <laughs> and gone with distributor. <laughs> um, I did not go with distributor distributor initially. And that was only because I was looking at Apple's website. Um, they have uh, under compressor, which is how you make an iTunes mm-hmm. store package. They had like a list of four aggregators that they recommended there, mm-hmm. and then and then um, I also had been I'd made friends with somebody who was on the iTunes team, but now has moved over. He actually reached out to me at NAB and said, "Hey, let's I, I work I work at Apple for iTunes, and I want to help you, you know, get your movie up here." Now, granted, I, I probably. Um, shouldn't say too much about that because he wasn't like sponsoring me or whatever. Sure, but, sure, 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 sure. Um, but anyway, he did introduce himself and he, he still referred me. I went through the regular channels. I want to make that very clear. Yes. He referred me to a list of, um, aggregators, uh, and, that and on that right. list were these, you know, I, I found some of the same ones. So I ended up picking an aggregator and, uh, um, Anyway, it it was just it was the 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 front end on their website looked very very clean and upfront. Here's the costs, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but the I'm back like, oh, end. this is great. The back end was kind of a nightmare. And if you had done it before, now that I've done it, I could go do it easy. But I think this is the an interesting thing that speaks to complicated systems mm-hmm. is the people who build them and then the people who use them just kind of get used to it and don't recognize how bad it is until somebody who's never done it before comes in and says, Oh my gosh, this is like a total nightmare. I just want to get my movie up and compared to VHX where I'm, this is kind of where I was going with all this VHX. Um, I want to add a new language. No problem. I just pack on the subtitles. I can switch them out at any time. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. It's great that way. It gives me full control, and I'm not paying anybody to click buttons. I can click myself. Whereas going through an aggregator, well, they're the ones with the iTunes Connect um, account, account, and and I can't 
you know, have access to any of that. So I have to send them stuff, then they have to QC it, then they send it to iTunes. Well, yeah, the connect, whole- and it's just this whole long joke of a process. But I knew I had to get there because I had lots of people writing in and saying, well, let me know when it's on iTunes. Yes. You know, you know look, you made a movie about a final cut, about an Apple product. For yeah. God's sakes, you got to be on iTunes. Exactly. There's no, no question about it. No, picking the right aggregator for your needs is extremely important. And it's, it could be as costly as picking the wrong distributor. Um, mm-hmm. if, if you're not careful. Now has, now finally has the, is the money, is the movie made money? Is it in profit? Yeah, I mean, I didn't spend very much to make it. Like, so are you retiring? Like, are you retiring to the French Riviera off this movie? No, 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 no. <laughs> so, um, on VHX, we are close to grossing ten thousand dollars. That's awesome. Uh, on uh, Amazon, which I haven't done a lot of push to Amazon, mostly because their profit share is not great. There is nothing um, right. and I haven't I haven't unlocked Prime yet. I will probably unlock Prime. Uh, eventually, but, uh, yeah, keep it off of there till then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but it's, I think my half of it has, so this is kind of the net of it is mm-hmm. around like six or seven hundred dollars is all. Okay. Um, and then iTunes is actually, I checked, uh, the other day and it's humming along. Well, it's been up there for about a month and it's made about two grand. Hey, man, that's awesome. So, you know, we're, I, you know, I, I think we, the sales keep coming, which is nice. So that's, and it's going to keep coming because there's, I, I promise you, there is not going to be a competition, a, yeah. a, a competitive film coming out like the other documentary about Final Cut Pro <laughs> X. You're not going to have that problem. Like you are the only one in your category and you are the only person ever to make a movie in that category. So I think you're good for a while. And this movie will probably continue to generate money for you. Um, for, for at least the next handful of years, if not longer, depending on how, um, you might have to update it eventually. You might have to do a sequel to it. Uh, which brings me to my next question. Yeah. Are you planning a series of documentaries on editing software, like the Avid doc, <laughs> the Premiere doc, <laughs> the Da Vinci Resolve doc? The, well, and then of course the great, Sony Vegas doc. Don't forget we, that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 We've, we've got, we've actually got a great name picked out maybe you and i can co-produce this one yes. um it's called back on track da vinci resolve nice <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome um <laughs> back on track the sequel <laughs> right um that's that's awesome that you is know, awesome. i think i think what's interesting and i kind of wish i'd found an angle there's so many things to try to pack into oh sure into my doc, but, uh, I, but I actually do think that in a lot of ways, the final cut pro 10 story has a lot of parallels to the avid in the nineties story versus, mm-hmm. um, you know, film based editing because film editors in oh, the nineties said, yeah. I'm not editing on a computer. That's a toy. Mm-hmm. And what did they say about final cut pro 10? I'm not editing on that. It's a toy. So it's, it's really interesting to, uh, to see the parallels there. Um, I mean, I, there I might be there might be a place for the Avid documentary. I'm just saying. There might, you know, it might be. I I feel less inspired by Avid just because in the last 20 years, I feel like they've just totally stagnated, and yes, the whole film industry has accepted the fact that, and they're comfortable with the fact that Avid really isn't moving the ball forward in any significant way. They just all they do is patch the holes in the ship. That's, that, no, no, <laughs> That's it's right. no, no, and I'm not trying to be a dick about it, but it's the truth, like. Because I've worked with, com- you know, I worked with Avid, and I've I've worked with you know studios that work with Avid, and having to deal with that workflow, and I literally like I I walk into the edit suite, and they're like, they're on Macs that are like ten years old mm-hmm. because they're the only ones that are completely stable with the software, and that's the only thing. So everything is super slow; it can't really run really well. And it's just like annoying as all hell. And I know there are more advanced, you know, systems out there, but these are the ones that they were renting. And I feel well, like every single time there was a problem, which was daily, yep. the avid guy would come in and like literally just patch a hole in the ship that obviously have leaks and it will drown. It will drown eventually. It will go under eventually, but it, it, it they're just. Isn't that the those. irony though? People like Avid, it's so stable, it's so solid. Well, you're paying, yeah, if you're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for Avid support every year, yeah. I guess you, I guess it'll 
be reliable in that sense. Um, <laughs> or you could download DaVinci Resolve or Final Cut Pro X. I mean, yeah, yeah why yeah, not yeah. use something a little that's that's also reliable but doesn't demand the the full attention support like like right. you were talking about. <laughs> It's like the, no, no. It's like buying a really bad car, and, yeah. and then you have to pay <laughs> for like a mechanic. A no, no, yeah. no. For a mechanic to live in the back house <laughs> of your home to make sure the car is running perfectly all the time, and it breaks down daily, so the dude's always working. But the car is going to mean the, the mechanic's fees are another hundred thousand dollars plus the car, and they're like, "Wow, that car is really stable." Sure, <laughs> you're paying a hundred grand for the dude to live in your back. Oh man, yeah. It uh, <laughs> this this well, whole conversation has gone off off the tracks. I hate this. We've thing. gone we've gone off the we 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 can't help ourselves. We just keep getting back into this NLE <laughs> thing. But no, I mean it, it is something I've been asked. Like, what about like the Adobe Premiere story and whatnot? And like, it's just for me. I was I'm very passionate about Final Cut Pro 10. Sure, 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 sure. I'm not so passionate about the other systems, uh, uh, and it's not even about Final Cut Pro 10 per se. I'm just passionate about the idea that a person with no connections, with very few resources, can go out and make a movie. Like anything that is going to empower that and enable that. So, you know, and in you 2003, did. for me, it was the DVX 100. You oh, know, 100A, sir. 100A. Yeah, the 100A. <laughs> Please right. let's let's keep it straight. <laughs> And don't forget, there was a 100B. I was about to say there was a B, but there was like only weirdos bought the B. Honestly, it's it was about the A. Everyone had the A. Okay, I don't want to hear about the B. It was about the A. We have gone so off the tracks. Everyone listening is like, but, I thought this was a, 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 a well, conversation. Well, no, but that. it is about like now, like I was just shooting a 4K, 24 frame a second footage of my um, – I just had a kid the other day. We were talking mm-hmm. about this before the show. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had my second daughter earlier this week and, uh, and I was shooting some 4k video mm-hmm. on my iPhone that honestly like is really, really good quality. Just like mom used to do, but different. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to me, it's like, well, what's, you know, there's, there's no more excuses and, and that, so I see Final Cut Pro 10 fitting into that, that world. And that's actually what I'm more passionate about. Final Cut Pro 10 could be could go away and something else could come about and mm-hmm. or or you know and then there's other tools that could come around then that's where I'm going to be anywhere that is is going to get rid of the gatekeepers mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that is going to allow me to connect to my audience mm-hmm. or connect to an audience directly and for us to just have a good time and not be told you can't do it you know because that's what I was told when I was a kid growing up this all goes down to like childhood. Mm -hmm. psychology and drama which was i wanted to make movies because Mm -hmm. i saw my heroes george lucas and steven spielberg making movies Mm -hmm. and i was told you will never get to do that so stop dreaming about it oh yeah well i'll show you yeah exactly (laughs) and along the time along that the way you know we saw all these innovations and things come about so when people react negatively to um, the message that, oh, filmmaking has, you know, gotten easier. It's more accessible. It's more powerful. Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, 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 no. Let's keep everything the way it is and let's keep people out. Um, I'm very, you know. So that's avid, basically, is what you're saying. Yeah. It's <laughs> avid. It's, it's 35 millimeter film. Even though I think 35 millimeter film is beautiful, it's a, it's a system that requires so much support and resources and money. Resources and, stuff, and money sure. that it represents to me. This, you know, it's the adult, it's the teacher, it's the parent, it's whoever telling um, 12 year old me, stop dreaming, stop, you know, Got pretending. <laughs> Brad, man, I, I, I thank you for being raw and honest about your entire distribution process with <laughs> Off the Tracks. It was a fascinating story to listen to. You are very candid, and I hope it does help somebody out there listening in whatever country you're listening in. Oh. Um, that hope it helps you guys uh, figure out what's the best path for for you. But Brad, thank you so much for being uh, so honest and 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 forthright with your journey, sir. And uh, and of course, thank you for allowing off the tracks to be part of IFH TV. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what the tribe thinks of of my movie. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully they're positive. <laughs> I think they'll be. I think they'll be okay. But and you know and and 
the same thing. MLEs stir up feeling feelings. I know that. <laughs> well, no, look, the bottom line is it's the same thing that you were saying about the gatekeepers and stuff like that. I mean, I, I'm a dude that's opening up a streaming service, mm-hmm. you know, aimed at the audience that I love the most, which are filmmakers, screenwriters, creators, artists. And, uh, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not spending millions of dollars to do it. And I'm able to go out there and do it because of the tools, because of the things that are out there to be able to make these things happen. And the, and you just did a story about one of those tools that really did help a lot of people tell their story. So thanks again, man, for being on the show. And uh, no more, uh, you're not allowed on for at least a hundred episodes. <laughs> After, no more conversations with Brad. This is enough to is more than now. If you come back with an avid movie, you're, you're first in line. We're back on track. Man. <laughs> We're back on, or back on track with David Resolve. <laughs> That's such a – I could call back – I'll call Black Magic. I think we can make this happen. I think so. <laughs> Thanks again, Brad. Yep. Thank you, Alex. I want to thank Brad for coming on and sharing his experience with the tribe today. I was so inspired by his story that I included him in my book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, uh, in one of the chapters as a case study because it is the definition of – of being a film entrepreneur and the end game for him again wasn't always money. Yes, he wanted to make some money with it, sure and he did, but the bigger benefit to him was getting his name out there into the world, getting his brand, making him a thought leader in the space that he was going after which was film editing in Final Cut Pro X. And that's, you gotta have to think about that, guys. It's not always about the cash. There are multiple revenue streams. There are multiple services. There are multiple things that you can do to generate revenue from your film. And Brad is a perfect example of that. I'm sure he's gotten many jobs because he made off the tracks and put it out there into the world. So, Always think a bit differently about how you're making your films. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at filmtrepreneur.com forward slash zero three one. And if you want to catch this amazing documentary off the tracks and a bunch of special extended interviews with his guests in the movie, you can watch that on Indie Film Hustle TV. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv and do a search for off the tracks or go to the show notes and I'll have a link to it there directly. Thanks again for listening, guys. As always, the power is in your hands. Be a film entrepreneur. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast at filmtrepreneur.com. 